The challenges we face to produce enough food in the future are just unimaginable. Uh, we have to raise the wheat yield over the next 40 years by about uh, 60 to 70 percent. And I say we have to raise yield because there is no more land available. Uh, on top of it, we have real water shortages in the grain basket of, of uh, South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal. Uh, the water tables are falling very, very fast. And in 2050 also, it's, it's hard to comprehend, but every fourth human being will live in these four countries. Uh, it's about 2.2 billion. So just to make sure that the population can be fed is, is a major challenge. And wheat aside, rice uh, are the two major stables. So we have an incredible challenge. And the longer we wait, the more difficult it will be, because we also have to face the consequences of uh, global climate change. And wheat is in particular sensitive uh, to increasing temperature. Based on models which we have based on experiments, uh, you can roughly, as a rule of thumb, say for every degree Celsius degree temperature increase uh, during the wheat season, the yield potential goes down by 10%. So, if the modelers, the, the climate modelers are correct, and the global temperature will go up by 2 degrees by 2050, that means that today's variety would have a yield potential which is 20% less than what is currently produced. On top of it, we have to add the 60% we need just to keep pace with the population growth. And that means that compared to today's varieties, we have to increase the yield potential by about 80%. This is a challenge which maybe wheat breeders can understand how big it is. For the normal human being, it may not sound much, but it's just incredible and we have to really bring all the brains of the world together uh, to find new ways. We talk about modeling, uh, not modeling, creating new wheat plants which can use the light much more efficiently. Uh, we are looking into increasing uh, some of the yield components like grain size and grain number. But we have to bring all this together. We have to use much, much better agronomy because otherwise the consequences are disaster. There will be social unrest and what we have seen today, what is happening in North Africa, that will be just minor compared to what happened if we really cannot feed the population. When UG99 broke out, there were about maybe five or six real stem rust experts left for the once most important disease in cereals. And that of course was a consequence of the complacency. Nobody wanted to fund uh, stem rust research anymore. And, and, and that's where it is. So when this Polar Global Rust Initiative was founded, uh, the expertise from around the world was brought together. And we were also really, really lucky and uh, to have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to make such a serious and long-term commitment. And if we would have an outbreak of stem rust, for example, in the grain basket of, of Asia, in South Asia, millions and hundreds of million people could be affected because the disease does, if there is a serious epidemic, the disease does not only damage the plant, it can kill the plant completely. So you would harvest uh, nothing. And that's why we were so extremely afraid. And the other point is also because plant breeders were rather successful in developing resistant cultivars. Most countries are currently not prepared to use fungicides. So if, if you are prepared to use fungicide, you can say if the rust or the disease comes, I, I apply fungicides. But because plant breeders were rather successful, uh, the farmers today are not equipped really to uh, apply fungicides on a large scale. And that really would mean we would be very, very unprepared and uh, the damage would, could be uh, dramatic and very catastrophic. Uh, and that's why we were so extremely concerned. We simply couldn't believe that there is a new race which would be so uh, aggressive and really uh, be vulnerable or uh, attack most of our germplasm. Uh, for, well, I mean, our scientists then checked and it was confirmed that we had uh, a new race which was very, very aggressive and it basically could attack most of the wheat which was grown by then worldwide. Uh, it was very clear for, for the CIMIT scientists and concerned wheat researchers that this was a real risk and then uh, the Director General 
of CIMIT by then, Professor Reeves, he sent out a, a letter, uh, a press release, alerting the world about what has happened, but by then really nobody paid attention to it. Uh, by then there was overproduction of wheat, there was no sign of food crisis, everything seems to be, well, I mean, okay. So nobody really paid attention except a few scientists. And then in 2005, uh, the, the fungus moved by air to Kenya. And in 2005, Dr. Borlock was in Kenya and he saw the damage which this fungus does on, on wheat germplasm. And then he really alerted the bell and he put in all his reputation to really get the message to, to the world community, to donors, to scientists alike, that we are sitting here on a time bomb and it needs to be addressed as soon as possible. Uh, as a response of this one, um, uh, a, for, uh, a task force was formed, which looked into it and came up with recommendation. And then fortunately, and thanks to the reputation and all the weight which Dr. the name of Dr. Borlo carried, uh, the donors uh, started to respond. They provided funding, uh, USAID, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and that really allowed then the plant breeding institutions or institutes like the one which I'm working for, CIMIT, uh, to develop resistant varieties in, in a very, very short time. Usually it takes about, well, about 10, 15 years from starting across until you release it in farmers' fields. But in, in this case, we were very, very fast. And we have now, uh, today, as of uh, June 2011, about 19 stem rust resistant varieties released in the developing world, which are now in, in large scale multiplication. And I think that was a, a tremendous example and demonstration what could be achieved by modern plant breeding, provided the resources are made available. And uh, I always say you cannot argue with a hungry person because it's, the behavior becomes irrational. You are only driven by hunger and that's what makes people angry. So if we cannot pr provide enough food to the people uh, to, to really feed them, uh, it is very clear there will be, there will be social unrest. And, and look at where we currently have the biggest political problems. We have big political problems in West Asia, in North Africa, Central Asia. This is the region where the population gets up to 50% of their daily calories from wheat. This is uh, in, from North Africa until uh, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan and into Kazakhstan. This is the part of the world where the wheat consumption is by far highest. And exactly in this are also the regions where some of the highest imports are happening uh, because the wheat consumption is so high. What many people in the developed world really do not understand, uh, in, in, for example in the US or, or in Germany, the average household spends about 7 or 8 percent of their income on food. In developing countries, the average Indian spends about 50 percent of his or income on food. And what also is really, if the wheat price in the US goes doubles, that should have basically very, very little impact on the bread price. Because wheat makes such a small amount of the cost of producing a bread uh, that even doubling, I mean, then okay, it gets 10 or, 20%, uh, 20, 10 or 20 cents more expensive. But in the developing world, many households buy actually the grain and then they process at home. So that means if the wheat price doubles, their expenditures basically also double as well. And that's why these, these consequences of price hikes for food have such dramatic consequences for households in the developing world, whereas the developed world households, I mean, they really hardly care about it and they really don't notice it. I had the chance to meet with, with Miss Ministers and, and very high ranking uh, officials from developing countries during the last year. They are, all are concerned about one issue and this is food security. How do we feed our people? I, I spoke to uh, very high ranking people from China. We had the agricultural commissioner of India for one week in Mexico to look at our wheat plots because he said, I need to see what technologies you can offer in order to make sure that we can feed our growing populations. I had a meeting with the secretary uh, for agriculture in, in Pakistan. We spoke two and a half hours 
food security, food security, how do we address the problems of global climate change, of heat and drought. And uh, I think in the next G20, food security is now also brought on the agenda of the global leaders. But what do you do with the countries like the Nepals, like the Bangladesh, like the Afghanistans, like the, the small countries? Wheat is the fastest growing food in Africa. What, 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 what are the African countries going to do? And so I think there is really a human responsibility. There is a, a moral. That, that's what I always say. We have a moral obligation to address the food issue. And it was already President Kennedy who in 1963 said, we have the means to feed the population. What we need is the will. And I think that, that speaks by itself.